So good afternoon officially to everybody who is um, joining us for this um, webinar, uh, which is entitled Autonomies and Political Parties. My name is uh, Verena Wiestaler. I am based at the Institute for Minority Rights of Europe Research in South Tyrol in the north of Italy. And it is my big pleasure to moderate this webinar, uh, which takes place in a framework of the celebrations of the 50 years of the Second Autonomy Statute in South Tyrol in the north of Italy. So throughout the years, there were um, a couple of webinars uh, discussing various dimensions of autonomy, of the South Tyrolean autonomy, but also um, discussing autonomies in a comparative way. And all those webinars have been organized jointly by the three Iraq institutions, that's the Institute for Minority Rights, the Institute for Comparative Federalism, and the Center for Autonomy Experience, together with the South Tyrolean Association for Political Science. Our webinar on political parties is the last one of this series, and I'm sure we will have a fantastic finish. So I'm very happy to host, although just virtually and not in uh, presence in Bozen, um, such a great round of experts, but also very nice colleagues and actually also friends. Um, and I am uh, I'm very, very happy to be able to host this webinar and speak to you and um, also about our joint um, interests that are regionalist parties, autonomist parties, ethnic parties, or whatever you want to call them. I will now shortly present the speakers um, in the order that we agreed uh, that they would then give their presentations. Um, and after the four presentations that we will have, we will open the floor for questions um, from the public. So I will start with um, Anthony Elias um, and Nuria franco Guillen. They will present together. Um, Anthony Elias is a reader in politics at the Department of International um, Politics at the University of Aberystwyth. And Nuria franco Guillen is postdoctoral researcher and research associate at the same university. They together um, are part of a large horizon project, uh, Imagin, which is um, looking at the integrative mechanisms for um, um, addressing spatial ju uh, justice and territorial inequalities in Europe. And they have been um, creating a brand new data set on regionalist parties and organizations and their territorial demands and the framing of those demands. Second is Professor, uh, professor Emanuele Massetti. He is a professor at the Scuola di Studi Internazionali at the University of Trento, and he has been publishing um, since a long time um, and widely on regionalist parties and particularly on um, the parties' relations to the European Union. Then we continue with Matthias Cantamburlo. He is a postdoctoral researcher at the University Carlos III in Madrid. And also he has been engaged in, uh, uh, in the creation or in the development of a data set, uh, the Regionalist Manifesto project, which um, works with or which is based on party programs. Um, and also Matthias has published a lot on uh, regionalist parties and uh, new uh, party cleavages. Last but definitely not least, uh, Christina Zuber, Professor Christina Zuber, she is a professor of German politics at the Department of uh, Politics and Public Administration at the University of Constance. And uh, also Christina has been engaged in the creation of a data set uh, for based on an expert survey on ethnic parties in Western um, Europe and also in Eastern Europe, together with her um, colleague uh, Edina. Um, help me with a name which I cannot pronounce, but Thank I know. You. So thank you very much from the University of Fribourg currently. Um, so a great line of uh, speakers and I'm very much looking forward now to the uh, presentations. And as I said, um, more or less 10 minutes each and afterwards we open the floor for Q&A. Anven and Nuria, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. So I will um, present. Uh, if I can find the slides to share with you. Okay, can you see those? Yeah, okay, great. So, um, as Verena mentioned, Nuri and I have been uh, working on um, a, 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 a project which is large of a broader um, horizon project, which has actually now come to an end. 
um, a few months ago. Um, but as part of that project, uh, we were working on um, looking specifically at movements for self-determination across Europe. Uh, and with a particular interest in uh, the discursive strategies uh, of these movements uh, around how to achieve territorial empowerment. So we were, we were looking at um, questions uh, including how do actors try to advance and build support for territorial empowerment. And specifically, we were interested in trying to map and explain what kinds of territorial claims do uh, these actors make and how do they justify them or frame them. Um, for today's presentation, uh, we're just going to focus on a, a, a small part of the, of the data set that we have. We're looking specifically at claims for territorial empowerment uh, or territorial demands. Um, and um, because we have uh, uh, quite limited time, I'm going to give you the key findings right at the start. So this is a spoiler alert for what's to come. Um, so, so what we find and what we'll talk in a little bit more detail about is, um, we find calls for territorial empowerment, which have been very different in nature uh, across the different movements that we've looked at in Western and Eastern Europe, um, but also that these calls really change a lot uh, over time, uh, uh, as well as across cases and actors. Uh, so quite a lot of, of a variation here. But in terms of general trends, what we find is that overall there is this shift in the kind of demand that is make, made from uh, demands which are quite moderate in their constitutional uh, scope, uh, especially during the 2000s, becoming more radical in the last decade. So uh, overall, we see this uh, shift uh, to, towards putting more pressure on the, on the um, constitutional status quo in different places. And we also find evidence of different kinds of territorial strategies, especially um, ones which are on the one hand highly pragmatic, uh, looking at different kinds of demands uh, and making those simultaneously versus um, territorial strategies which are much more focused and single issue uh, in nature. Sorry, so I want to, to interrupt, but I think that you're sharing the uh, different PowerPoints. Oh. Uh, what we can see here is the, is the imagine coding scheme. Hang on, sorry, thank you. I can see the slides, so I don't know. No, is that the one? I think so. Overview, context, our focus, claims territorial empowerment. Yeah, that's, yeah. Can you see yeah. the map now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> So this is the data set then, the Framing Territorial Demands data set. So what we've got here um, is data on territorial demands and framing strategies of uh, 61 actors across 12 European regions, uh, those regions shown in that map there. Um, and we've done some additional coding of independence movements specifically to bring the data up to 2021. Um, the one distinctive thing about this data set is that it includes political parties, but also civil society movements. Um, and what we've done is a, is a content analysis of political documents. Um, so uh, collecting political documents and coding those uh, using the original coding scheme that we developed for this purpose, where we are interested in two things. What kinds of territorial demands do they make? And then what frames do they use to justify these demands? Uh, um, we're not going to say anything about frames today, although there's lots of interesting stuff there. Um, so really, I'm just going to focus in now again on these demands. So what kinds of claims for territorial empowerment do these actors make? So very quickly, just to uh, give an overview of our coding scheme and the kinds of territorial demands that we are talking about here. We distinguish between three um, basic types of demand. Firstly, territorial demands that imply some kind of redistribution of political authority. At the most extreme, this would be independence. So withdrawing a territory completely from the state. Demands for a fundamental change in the state structure. So a different kind of territorial um, model. So uh, calls for creation of regional level of government, for example, uh, creation of a federal state. So we call these fundamental demands. 
Then there are calls for um, not to change the fundamental nature of the state, but rather to tweak it in some way, to modify the state structure. So, for example, uh, you already have self-rule, but you want more uh, devolution of decentral uh, decentralization. You want more shared rule uh, and so on. Then we have a second category, which uh, includes demands not for any constitutional change or not for any kind of form of redistribution of authority, but rather their calls that uh, ask for a higher level of government to do something for the territory. So to take policy action uh, in the territory's interests or to stop doing something which harms the territory's interests. So, for example, calls for the state to invest in transport uh, in Wales because transport is underdeveloped and that's harmful for, for Welsh interests. Uh, and then we have a third kind of residual category, uh, general demand, where there's some kind of call for change, but it's not clear what that is. So we're talking about um, independence demands, demands for fundamental change, demands to modify the state structure, demands for action, and then general demands. Okay, so some key findings. So um, overall, if we look at the profile of demands uh, across time, across all of the cases that we look at, across all of the actors, overall what we see is that there has been uh, increasing pressure on the stability and integrity over plurina uh, uh, of plurinational states. Um, for example, uh, overall, the most demands have been ones for modification or action so either kind of, uh, in particular, more self-rule, um, but also these action demands, policy action in the territory. They're particularly dominant in the 2000s, um, but they're still the most salient uh, in the last decades, all the declining uh, in relative salience. The interesting thing, I think, also is increasing uh, calls for independence uh, over time. Again, uh, by the last decade, accounting for 30% of demands that we find and again, there is a general shift, therefore, in this pressure on, on the constitutional setup uh, with, through these calls for independence. Um, but there's also really important differences in different places. So we find, for example, in cases like Scotland, but also Bavaria, calls for independence have always been there. Uh, but in Bavaria in particular, have become less salient over time. In other places, these calls for independence have, have come to the fore, like uh, Catalonia, Wales, Galicia. And then we also have cases where you know, independence calls are just not there at all, like Ashubia, uh, the secular land. Uh, and rather in those cases, it's, it's demands around um, modification of the status quo, particularly important, action demands particularly important, but also some calls for fundamental uh, reform. So shifts over time, as well as across um, cases. But then what we also find is actually that um, a lot of the work on, on territorial demands of regionalist actors have really focused on uh, understanding what is the key demand that they make and categorizing parties uh, uh, on that basis. So, you know, this is a party which calls for independence or this is a party that calls for more autonomy. Actually, what we find is that um, most political parties have uh, a lot of territorial goals that they hold and advocate for at the same time, um, simultaneously. And again, in, in uh, the documents that we look at, 62% of them contain at least two types of territorial claims. And there are some, uh, I think there was one document from Esquerra Republicana de Catalonia, which had about nine different demands in there. So kind of pretty much everything that we were looking for, we found uh, in, in one of these documents. And what we find is that these parties use these demands uh, as part of a, a very pragmatic political strategy where they combine long-term goals such as independence or fundamental reform uh, with more moderate short-term objectives uh, aimed at empowering the territories in the meantime. Quite often uh, recognizing that independence, yes, ultimately that's what we want, but we also recognize that we can't achieve it now. Therefore, in the meantime, let's also try to advance autonomy in these other different ways. Um, and I think this is most dramatically seen uh, in this graph here. This looks at just actors, political uh, actors who have a claim for independence in one of the documents and looking at what else do they call for at the same time. 
Uh, and if you look at the green bar there, so this is the data for um, the, the 2010s, there is this increasing salience of calls for independence, but at the same time, it's alongside calls for modification of the status quo and calls for policy action. There is a caveat here, that kind of um, pragmatic strategy is very typical for political parties, but it's not at all what we find for civil society organisations. Uh, and most of these are really single issue organisations, really just focused on the main territorial demand that they were established to push for or that they prioritise. Uh, and again, this is particularly clear if we look at movements for independence. Uh, yes, Cymru uh, was a civil society organisation in Wales formed in 2014. All of its documents only talk about independence, nothing else. Uh, and you compare that to Clyde Cymru in Wales, which is a political party, where you see much more of this polit uh, pragmatic strategy independence, but also more autonomy action demands. Similarly with Assemblea Nacional Catalana, um, vast majority of calls again for independence where it does call for something else they are uh, action demands and they are calls on the Spanish state to allow a referendum on Catalan independence so to do something uh, because that's in the competence of the states to allow that referendum um, and that's it I'm going to stop there because I've run out of time there's a lot more to say but hopefully that just gives you some of the headline headline findings from from our data set uh, there. Excellent, uh, Anven, for that um, introduction to the party family and what they actually want now and what do the parties demand and how do they want to proceed. And also very nice to see this uh, historical evolution. We will now proceed with Emanuele Massetti, who will give us more insights into these um, specific parties um, in relation to their position towards the European Union or the European Integration Project. Emanuele, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm also. Uh, sharing the screen with you. Um, can you see it? Yes, it works perfectly. Okay. So first of all, um, thank you to Verena Vistaila for organizing this very interesting webinar. It's a pleasure to, to sit around this virtual table with other experts of, of, of the subject uh, of uh, autonomies and political parties. I was given the task to speak about um, regionalist parties positioning on European integration, and that's a task I take up very gladly for two reasons. Uh, the first one is that I published an article last year on this subject, and the content of the article constitutes the, the bulk of this presentation. And the second uh, reason is that um, regionalist parties positioning on European integration is still uh, a sort of um, open debate within the literature, um, particularly uh, because several studies have, uh, first of all, they have developed in different periods, uh, they've used different uh, case studies covering different countries, uh, but also because there are basic um, um, disagreements or at least not a perfect coincidence in the conceptualizations of, of key concepts such as Euroscepticism or Europhilia. Here I've included just a mention of the differences between the monodimensional uh, definition of target and, and Sherbiak, the, the very famous distinction between soft and hard Euroscepticism compared to the two-dimensional conceptualization proposed by uh, Kopechki uh, and, and Mudd in, uh, in the early 2000s. And studies are also based on different uh, data which are available. Uh, for instance, uh, the comparative manifesto project based on, on the analysis of sentences in party manifestos, as opposed to the um, Chapel Hill expert surveys data set, which is based, as the, as the title says, on, on expert surveys, but also other data sets that are out there, such as EPAC, uh, which was produced by uh, Christina and, and, and Edina Soskic. 
Uh, and maybe something is also coming out from uh, the data set that was just introduced by Anwen and, uh, and Nuria. Um, so this, um, let's say, multiplicity and plurality of, of data, of approaches, have basically created a sort of disagreement in the literature uh, between scholars who tend to see the European party family as rather homogeneously uh, Europhile, and others who have um, produced accounts that are a little bit more, uh, let's say, nuanced. Um, Gomez Reno has basically summarized this split in the literature with this sentence that I quote, uh, perspectives are divided amongst those who maintain that the party family still proposes clear Europhile positions, and those who stress that attitudes towards European integration have evolved towards Euroscepticism. And amongst the, the latter are um, Enwell, Enwen Elias herself, uh, Eve Edborn, and uh, people like uh, Michael Keating, myself. Uh, whereas um, scholars that tend to <clears throat> represent a situation of a homogeneous party family in favor of European integration uh, have based their studies primarily on the chess data sets. And I'm referring to scholars such, such as uh, Seth Jolly and uh, Becker and others. So here I'm presenting a new study which was uh, conducted in the period 2020, yeah, 2019, 2020, and it concerns 67 regionalist parties uh, distributed in seven um, member states of the European Union, uh, all from Western Europe. So this is a, a, an important limitation of the study. Countries from Central Eastern Europe are, are not included. A major strength of the study, however, is that it covers a rather long period from 1970 to 2019. And it has a mixed method approach because we have statistical analysis, but also um, evidence emerging from uh, several case studies. Um, the, 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 the analysis is based on uh, different data sets, including the regional authority index, RAY, both in self-rule and shared rule, <clears throat> and um, also other um, measurements of regional engagement in new affairs, as well as um, regionalist parties positioning not only on European integration, which is the, so to speak, de dependent variable, but also on other salient ideological dimensions, such as center periphery and the left right dimension. So if you have um, questions, curiosities on how these dimensions were measured and the underlying coding schemes, I can speak about them uh, later on. Now I, I would like to jump to the results, uh, starting with this, um, a uh, line which expresses the longitudinal change of the overall party family from 1970 to, 19, to 2019. So what you see in the vertical axis is the percentage of regionalist parties displaying a Europhile position. And you see that this percentage uh, is um, as a, an upward trend from 1970 to the early 90s. It reaches its peak in 1991, and then it decreases slightly up to the early 2000s when there is uh, an evident drop. Uh, then it stabilizes again around the time of the, of the Lisbon Treaty. There is even a slight increase at the time of the approval of, of Lisbon. And again, a gradual but evident um, decrease 
starting more or less with the um, with the financial crisis and the and the euro crisis. Uh, so, although most of the period we find more than fifty percent, it, it also up to more than eighty percent of regionalist parties having a europhile position, uh, we end up with a situation where the percentage uh, goes below 50% at precisely at 48% in more recent years. So um, this study basically sus subscribes to the position that there has been an evident cooling down of support uh, for European integration, if not an increase in, in, in Euroscepticism. Uh, this longitudinal change can be explained uh, in several ways. First of all, there are uh, theoretical perspectives advanced uh, before this uh, downward trend took place, precisely by Marx and others, Marx, Wilson and Ray, if I'm not mistaken, in an article uh, which was published in 2002 they already predicted that regionalist parties can be expected to strongly support economic integration and to support more cautiously political integration. And indeed, um, looking at, at some case studies, uh, what uh, emerges from, from, from these cases is that many regionalist parties, particularly those who had uh, more assertive demands, if not explicitly uh, independentist demands, were rather let down by the process uh, of constitutionalizing the EU, particularly up to the presentation and the drafting of the EU constitution uh, for two reasons. The first one was the non-inclusion in the treaties of a system for internal enlargement, by which regionalist parties mean the possibility of gaining independence from the host member state and becoming virtually automatically as a new, mem a new member of, of the European Union. So there were proposals to include um, some uh, provisions in this respect in the constitution and these were uh, rejected outright. And the second reason is that um, institutions such as the committee of the regions that were already present were not strengthened enough. Uh, they were strengthened compared to Maastricht but not uh, enough to meet the expectations of, of regionalist parties. Um, secondly, uh, there has been a, a general effect of the, of the Euro crisis, which has uh, spread Euroscepticism, particularly in some European countries. And this general trend has also affected uh, regionalist parties. This was particularly evident amongst leftist and radical left regionalist parties in Spain, for instance. Um, and, and I'm talking about Spain because um, uh, in Spain there, there was also the emergence of new regionalist parties uh, on the radical left, such as the, the CUP, the candidacy for um, uh, the people unity in Catalonia which adopted a, a very critical perspective on the EU. And finally, something that uh, Anwen Elias has just talked about, a general increase in secessionist positions, which interact with what I was saying before, uh, the delusion of not having a, a system for internal enlargement. And more recently, when Catalonia and Scotland tried to go for independence, in the early, let's say, between 2012 and 2017, so the start of the long independence campaign in Scotland in 2012, and then the, the, the two referenda held in Catalonia 2014 and 2017, uh, the position took by the EU on these 
uh, attempts at independence were clearly <coughs> uh, in support of member states' territorial integrity. And that created uh, some sort of delusion amongst uh, regionalist parties, particularly amongst voters more than amongst uh, party leaders, to be, to be fair. Um, going a little bit uh, inside the data, here I'm showing um, a different, uh, the different probabilities to find Europhile regionalist parties in different countries uh, in two uh, periods. So comparing the period 1990 to 1995 and the period 2010 to 2015, and these two periods also um, represent uh, um, historical uh, periods in which the level of regional authority has in, uh, considerably increased in all cases except in France. So we have, for instance, the um, Wales and Scotland which didn't have any or didn't have the same level of self-government as they had after 1997. Uh, in Italy, there were many reforms at the beginning of the 2000s. And again, Spain, Belgium, they also had important reforms which increased the level of regional authority in the second period compared to the first one. And yet what we see is that the probability to find Europhile regionalist parties has significantly decreased. In particular, what emerges from the data is that regional engagement in EU affairs tends to produce um, a more Eurosceptic attitudes among regionalist parties, probably because they also realize the gap that there is between acting the EU as a region and acting in the EU as a member state, um, especially when some member states are uh, smaller or have a, uh, a smaller population compared to some regions in, in Western Europe. The second um, point that I want to make is the relationship between positioning on European integration and left-right positioning and being autonomist or secessionist. So again, the vertical axis in, uh, indicates the probability to, to find a Europhile regionalist party. And uh, what this graph shows is um, a clear trend for radical left and radical right parties to adopt more Eurosceptic positions independently of being autonomist or secessionist, but as the different bars, so the, 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 the dark or the light bars indicate, there is also a significant effect of adopting a secessionist rather than an autonomist position. So secessionist regionalist parties tend to be in general less supportive of European integration or more impatient with the institutional structure that the European Union has adopted. So I skip um, directly to my conclusions, um, <clears throat> which can be summarized as such. So the regionalist party family has been tendentially Europhile for most of the period studied. And it's still, to some extent, uh, Europhile, considering that uh, the most important regionalist parties are uh, on the Europhile side of, of the spectrum, although their support for European integration has, has cooled down. However, there has always been a sort of uh, great variance within the party family. So the, the support for European integration has never been that homogenous and it's never been extremely convinced. Um, EU federalist positions have been rather exceptional within the party family. 
and support has remained rather pragmatic. So it has always been evaluated um, in respect to uh, how much it could serve the purpose of gaining um, authority, of gaining powers from member states or achieving independence. And uh, in the last two decades, there has been an evident growth in Euroscepticism or a drop of support in European integration. And this has depended primarily on uh, increasing cessationism, as it was pointed out uh, in the previous pre presentation, and also the, um, the changes in institutional powers of the regions um, have worked actually in against support of European integration because the more uh, the regions are engaged in the European uh, policy making process, the more they get frustrated, especially compared to uh, the position that small member states enjoy. So I stop here and uh, I'm available for questions. Thank you very much, Emanuele. Uh, very interesting to see how the positions on the European um, or support or uh, yeah, support for European integration has changed over time. Uh, we now continue with uh, Matthias Santamburlo, who will um, talk about uh, the party's relations to populism. Emanuela, can you maybe stop sharing your screen? Yeah, excellent, perfect, thank you. So, uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, great, so, uh, hi, also from my side. Uh, first of all, thank you, Verena and uh, Jurak, for uh, inviting me. It's, it's of course, uh, a great pleasure to be here with all these great scholars who have basically uh, in, in the last, uh, let's say, years or maybe the last decade also shaped really much this, this agenda on, on territorial politics, uh, regionalist parties and so on. And they have also been a, a big source of inspiration for my own research um, and so on. And uh, so it's uh, from my side, it's really nice to meet you all, uh, all around, even if it's just online. So maybe we can meet at some conference. So um, I will talk a little bit about uh, new challenges for regionalist parties, or let's say political parties and autonomies. Verena has kindly asked me to speak about these new challenges. Um, so what I'm trying to do, so I, I'm the only one who <laughs> has uh, not prepared any slides, but anyway, I will uh, present um, based on a paper I have published, it's, it's a, a, a little bit older paper, around 2018. It is about uh, the effects of, of the Great Recession of the economic crisis on, uh, let's say, political parties in peripheral regions or regions with a strong center periphery cleavage. So I'm trying to, to draw a little bit. Uh, we, we have spoken about uh, about territorial claims by Unwind and the, the, the positions towards the EU. So I try to, to go a little bit beyond that by looking on how the Great Recession, how the changes in, in the last, let's say, 10, uh, yes, uh, 10 to 15 years have uh, affected these parties and uh, party competition uh, in, in these regions and in autonomous regions, basically. So speaking about challenges is, is kind of difficult, uh, new challenges, because uh, basically there is also a little bit of looking into the future, how will this develop and so on. So uh, that's always a little bit difficult. And uh, in the end, I try to to give some conclusions, but also to ask some questions, uh, basically to, to ask some questions for, for uh, discussion. So what can be the future uh, and uh, how developments will uh, unfold. So this is, uh, basically we have uh, suffered uh, turbulent times in the last years. We had uh, basically, uh, let's say uh, two crises, <laughs> the, the economic crisis, then we had the pandemic, uh, now we are facing the, the climate change crisis and so on. So uh, 
things are changing uh, quite uh, quickly. So there are uh, there are new parties emerging and so on. And of course, this is this is uh, everywhere. I mean, the, these challenges. Uh, every party uh, faces these challenges, but. Uh, Maybe the regional context uh, in which uh, regionalist parties act and so on uh, is a bit more complex than at the state level. So um, we have uh, really different regions. The, the, the economic crisis has affected uh, regions in a very different way as it has states, but within the states, each region uh, suffered the crisis in, in a different way. So, some regions uh, coped with it uh, better than others. And in the end, the, the regionalist party family in itself is, is really a heterogeneous party family. Uh, and um, we will talk a little bit about this. And uh, the final point, which maybe is the, the most important one, like uh, the comparative literature about uh, these new challenges or uh, how crises affect territorial politics and so on, is, is uh, very thin. So there is uh, the database is, 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 uh, is almost inexistent, although uh, we all have worked uh, in the last years to, to create new data and so on. But uh, comparative literature on how the economic crisis has affected regional politics is uh, very, very thin. So um, I will speak a little bit about uh, how the Great Recession affected uh, political dynamics in, in peripheral regions. This makes it necessary not only to speak about uh, regionalist parties, but uh, to go beyond, uh, because we, we have seen new parties emerging, which challenge regionalist parties and so on. Uh, so at the beginning, I try to to give a little bit the big picture. So how have these uh, political systems uh, in autonomous regions changed? And then I will look a little bit on the challenges for different parties. Okay, so uh, basically, it is really well documented that the 2008 financial crisis has had uh, profound and far-reaching effects on uh, politics in general. So. While uh, changes have been unfolding since the 1970s, the, the rise of the new left, the rise of the of the radical right, and so on in the 80s, but uh, the, the the Great Recession can be uh, like uh, defined as a critical juncture for accelerating these pre-existing changes. No? So uh, voters have punished the establishment, have punished established establishment parties on the one hand for contributing to bring about the Great Recession, but on the other hand, there is a kind of deeper dissatisfaction with uh, how democracy works. So as a result, we saw the rise of new or reinvigorated challenger parties and uh, very strong reconfigurations of the political space. So this basically has two dimensions, as I already said. Uh, one dimension is more economic and the other one is more uh, a political dimension. So how about these regions uh, with uh, strong center periphery dynamics? So the challenge uh, to political establishment has uh, not only taken place, of course, at the national level, but also at the subnational one. So we know from uh, research that uh, the, this is also some research by Emanuele, by the way. So we know that the dissatisfaction with democracy can be much more striking at the regional level, basically because uh, we have uh, we have had a lack of alternation in, in, in office uh, for very long periods of time. So this is the, the, the 50 years of, of the South Tyrolean autonomy. Uh, all of us who, who has have engaged a little bit with, with the South Tyrolean um, political system knows that, that there is a party which is in government since, uh, since the, the Second World War. Um, and so maybe at the regional level, uh, this presence of hegemonic parties, which don't need to be regionalist parties in the end, but uh, mainly regionalist parties have been quite hegemonic. So this raises questions about the type of democracy at the regional level on the one hand. So uh, there is this, uh, this this satisfaction or it can be quite stronger than uh, at, at, the, at the level of the state. And on the other hand, we have this uh, complex space of political competition. We have a strong center-periphery conflict in autonomous regions. So um, in, in during these uh, turbulent times, we have seen 
uh, regionalist parties uh, emerging, which combine, uh, on the one hand, of course, a pro-periphery agenda, but also a, a fierce anti-establishment agenda, uh, on the one hand. And on the other hand, we have uh, establishment parties, which are uh, regionalist parties from the establishment, which in the past have been challengers. No, they, in, in, the, in, the, in the comparative politics literature, they have always been uh, like defined as, as challenger parties because they challenge the state and so on. And now these parties in turn are being challenged uh, by, by new parties born in, in the wake of, of the Great Recession and with this uh, anti-establishment agenda. So we have, a, a, I, will, I would say, a, a very strong reconfiguration of the political supply. Uh, due to, on the one hand, statewide challengers, but also regionalist challengers. So in that sense, uh, establishment regionalist parties, uh, the, 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 we, we all know them more or less uh, in, in, in all these uh, autonomous regions, uh, they face kind of a double challenge. No, they, they, We have these new parties emerging from the Great Recession, which uh, in Spain could be Podemos and Ciudadanos. Then in, in, in Italy, the, the Five Star Movement, in Germany, uh, of course, Germany is, is a, a bit more strange case. If, if we speak about central peripheral dynamics, what we have the AFD, then we had the UKIP in, in the UK, which managed also to, to enter the, 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 the Welsh parliament. And uh, yeah, so all these new parties on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, Emanuele has already spoken about them, uh, these new regionalist challengers, which also are like uh, children of the Great Recession. We have the, 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 the coup party in Catalonia, which of course is older, but uh, it, it, uh, it managed to, to, to come into the uh, Catalan parliament in 2012. Then we have the, the Alternativa Galega de Esquerda, the, the, the left in, in, in Galicia. Then in, we have other parties in, in the Aosta Valley, like uh, Union Valdotén Progressist. We have uh, the Alpe coalition. And then we have a lot of new parties also in, in Trentino. We have uh, some of them in South Tyrol. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if uh, the South Tyrol and Freedom Party is really a children of the Great Recession, but in the end, they, they, uh, they were speaking like they are a movement party and so on. Uh, and they also had a strong anti-establishment rhetoric. And on the other hand, we have also some uh, new parties, which maybe are not really regionalist, but I would uh, like uh, stretching a bit the concept and putting them also there. For example, the, the, the new party in South Tyrol, which is the team Kölnsberger, which is also kind of strong, has been a strong anti-establishment party. And we have also the free voters in Bavaria, which maybe are not a regionalist party, but they are somehow challenging the, the CSU in Bavaria. So, we have we see that these uh, regionalist parties, these, these older regionalist parties, uh, face uh, some kind of double challenge. You no, know, on the one hand, uh, uh, and on the other hand, uh, we have seen uh, strong changes in all these political systems. I have looked, for example, at uh, two parad paradigmatic cases like uh, Bavaria and South Tyrol. So to uh, to go beyond a little bit this uh, Scotland Catalonia uh, thing, which is uh, all the time in the media. So. Uh, Bavarian South Tyrol, for example, are uh, known for having been the most stable political systems uh, at the regional level in Western Europe. Uh, the CSU or the SVP, the, the South Tyrol People's Party, have been the most dominant parties for a long time. They have always been on, uh, in government. Uh, but since the crisis, they have suffered uh, really significant changes. So. Uh, much stronger changes than in the rest of Germany, for example, and in the rest of Italy. Of course, they were starting from a more stable position, but uh, the changes unfolding in Bavaria and South Tyrol have been really, really big because of this double challenge in, in the end. So they have lost uh, a lot their dominance. We have seen an increase in volatility, uh, fragmentation, although the party systems already have been uh, quite uh, fragmented. And these two regions uh, have become much less consensual since the crisis, okay? So uh, we can see looking at these paradigmatic cases that, uh, I mean, if already these uh, places uh, change really much, so we can really speak of, of, of broader changes. So um, the regionalist party family in the end is uh, after the crisis much more heterogeneous since the emergence of these new parties. So, 
these new regionalist parties, uh, as we have seen uh, with data from, from the regional manifestos project, we can speak about this later on if you, if you want, if you, if you need some information about the coding scheme and so on. In, uh, we have looked at 14 regions uh, in Europe, uh, around 50 parties and so on. Uh, so we, we have seen that, first of all, this party family is much more heterogeneous after the crisis and uh, that new, these new regionalist parties in the end, uh, they emphasized much more, so new politics issues, anti-establishment rhetoric and so on, but also uh, issues of austerity uh, and much more than, than, than the old regionalist parties um, who in turn uh, have um, continued to, to speak very much about uh, center periphery issues. So what does this mean for, for the party family in itself? So first of all, uh, the regionalist party family since the crisis uh, is clearly divided by this new, uh, let's say, new politics conflict or uh, anti-establishment conf conflict. So this means that in, in, in future typologies, uh, we, we need to take this into account so that uh, there is this new divide no, between uh, anti-establishment or new regionalist parties and the old ones. And uh, uh, I was supposed to speak about the challenges. So this poses uh, different challenges, of course, uh, for different parties. So basically, to, to sum up, the, the big challenge, of course, is uh, how to navigate uh, in this crowded space. So we have seen that uh, from, um, from the presentations from Anven and, and Emanuele, that, uh, of course, uh, the issues for regionalist parties are territorial ones. Uh, they, they take positions to, towards the European Union, but they also positions themselves on the, on the left, uh, right. And so we have uh, this new, new uh, new challenge, which is an anti-establishment challenge, uh, and these new parties. So um, how to navigate within this crowded space? So for establishment parties at the regional level, it has, of course, been the biggest challenge how to respond uh, to these new parties, to this new anti-establishment challenge. And of course, for, for the challenger parties, for the challenger regionalist parties, uh, Basically, the, the big challenge is how to diversify their agenda beyond this anti-establishment rhetoric or the, uh, this anti-establishment issues. So uh, our research, basically, and where I can still uh, um, speak about empirical data is that uh, we have seen that all establishment regionalist parties have rhetorically or strategically accommodated this uh, new agenda, so this new democratic regeneration agenda. Uh, this can range from uh, direct democracy provisions, uh, electoral reforms, institutional reforms. So uh, in South Tyrol, there has been an attempt to reform the constitution, uh, the, 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 the autonomy stu statute from, from below, like giving more voice to the citizens. Uh, I would uh, put this, uh, this issue also within this uh, democratic uh, regeneration agenda. Uh, and they also have fo focused stronger on distribution. So uh, well, looking at the data, uh, which is based on party manifestos, we saw, so this development, uh, although in the end it was really difficult to find uh, a clear pattern uh, on how this new politics agenda has been combined with a traditional um, issues um, of like uh, the economy or uh, territorial ones. So we have seen, for example, in South Tyrol, in, in the Aosta Valley, in Catalonia, or in, in the Basque Country, uh, these new issues uh, have fueled a little bit the, ter the territorial debate. I mean, uh, Catalonia, of course, is uh, known by everybody. And uh, in other regions like Veneto, Scotland, Wales, and uh, the, the autonomous communities in Spain, uh, they have uh, connected this new politics dimension much more with economic issues. And on the other hand, it is also difficult to say if these moves by parties, so to, to rhetorically or strategical, strategically accommodate um, these new demands, uh, if some have succeeded uh, better than others. So I, I would let this for discussion afterwards. Uh, so can we say in the end that uh, regionalist parties have succeeded in um, like also electorally by accommodating these new parties? I would say uh, 
Uh, in my opinion, yes. In the last election, we have seen, for example, in the Basque Country, in Galicia, that uh, these new challengers uh, are almost disappearing and that uh, these uh, regionalist parties, uh, the, the regionalist left uh, in the Basque Country and in, in, in Galicia have, uh, have uh, gained a lot of votes. Uh, I would say also in Catalonia, Scotland and Wales, uh, although in, 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 in Wales and Scotland that this anti-establishment uh, challenge hasn't been so strong as in other regions. But I would say, uh, like to, 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 to summarize in the end, uh, that uh, regionalist parties have been quite uh, successful in managing all these, uh, these new challenges. And they are... Uh, they have been, uh, compared to other statewide parties, uh, much more successful. So I think my, my time's up. Uh, so I, I let this now for discussion. So what do you think? Uh, have they been uh, better in managing uh, all these conflicts because they have more strategic leeway in multi-level systems? Uh, or what do you think? So this is, I think, uh, my biggest contribution for discussion and for the, the future challenges of these parties. So thank you, and uh, I um, let it here. Thank you very much, Matthias. So by now we have gained quite a broad picture on um, regionalist parties in Western Europe. Let's now hear what Christina has to tell us about the parties in the East. So, yeah. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, I see we are losing participants every minute. It's getting late. Everyone's getting tired. So wake up, everyone. Stay on. <laughs> it's worth it, hopefully. Um, so um, yeah, I, I'm going to talk about um, new challenges. And you're going to see that I think the new challenges in Central and Eastern Europe are very old challenges. And um, the most drastic example of this is, of course, that again, a war is being fought, like the attack of Russia on Ukraine on the pretense of saving um, a supposed uh, minority abroad that uh, presumably needs um, saving. And we know this like old pattern quite well in European history, but it's also, I think, quite related um, to the topics we study, even though the context we normally take on in our field is, are much more violent and much less violent. Um, so new challenges are old challenges. Um, I'm, and I think the way I try to summarize this is in the title of my presentation is that um, as forbidden fruits, minority temperance and ongoing nation building. Um, the forbidden fruits, I'm uh, borrowing here from a very nice article that is actually already a couple of years old by Daniel Boxler and Edina Sertcik that came out in West European politics where they said that federalism is a forbidden fruit um, in Central and Eastern Europe, um, which has to do, of course, with the experience of um, ethnic federations um, like Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union that fell apart along the demarcation lines of the previous territorial units that had extensive autonomy. Um, um, so um, that's where I'm borrowing this um, theme from minority temperance, because um, I'm going to show you some data on um, comparative radicalism of demands of minority parties, uh, regionalist or ethno-nationalist minority parties in the East and the West, showing that on average, uh, minorities in Eastern Europe make much more modest claims than, than those in, in Western Europe. And um, the challenges of ongoing nation building that we're still seeing um, uh, in both the more stable places as well as the more extreme places that um, the question of um, states and, and nations is, um, are still um, not settled um, in, the, in the region. Um, so the forbidden fruit of federalism and territorial self-government. So um, I brought here a, a very nice overview from a recent Publius article by Zuzana Cergo and co-authors who have um, gone to, um, in, into detail on the cases that we find um, in Central and Eastern Europe after 1989 um, and tracking them uh, uh, and mapping them. And these are now cases of territorial self-government. So really solutions that actually do cater to the settlement areas of national groups. So kind of like your Catalonia in Central and Eastern Europe, because Catalonia is one of those regions where really there is 
a group that um, administers um, through its own elites, its own um, territory. And what you can see from the slide is if you think, have in the back of your mind, a number of other countries in this region that this is actually a very limited number of cases that have come up with these territorial solutions. And what they also show very nicely in this article is that these solutions have in many cases not come about um, internally, but they have often been imposed after um, violent conflicts, as was the case of course, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, where there was a settlement agreement with the Dayton constitution, which is the only federation we find in the region, now excluding Russia, um, uh, the Russian context. Um, and then um, other solutions that also had um, a short um, eruption of um, smaller, like violent episodes, like the Albanians in Macedonia that got decentralization arrangements that were some regions were actually formed, um, not sorry, no region was formed, but local self-government realizes cultural and um, uh, cultural rights of the Albanian population. Conversely, if we look at the, the rest, kind of the more sort of the, the countries that you probably thought, where are they? If we look at the more stable, more democratic and uh, states with stronger, um, with stronger, um, stronger governments um, and also in many cases already European Union member states or at least had had a candidate status at the time that this analysis was done, you can see that um, here there is no territorial self-government granted. So we see like this um, interesting mix that it is in particular the more democratic and stronger states that had less external interference that have gone against the demands of um, territorial groups for territorial self-government. And sometimes people make the assumption that there are simply no claims being made, uh, uh, that simply there are no like regionalist parties um, or like minority parties making claims. That is not the case. So um, these groups definitely in um, almost all the cases had elites and continue to have elites that do make claims. Um, and during the 1990s, these claims were sometimes also quite far reaching. One example is, uh, or at least they were demanding a strong um, region with self-government rights. One example uh, is the Hungarians in Slovakia that actually always demanded, like their parties always demanded a continuous region in Southwestern Slovakia with self-government. Um, but that has been denied by the Slovakian state. And um, in fact, um, what the reforms did, um, um, so sorry, um, so that was kind of um, something I took away from this like really excellent um, article that I recommend to um, all of you um, that, yeah, we do get territorial self-government rather in the weirder or more problematic cases and the sort of more stable cases are actually the ones that opt for a rather centralized setup where they do decentralize, they all essentially eventually decentralize. It is um, in a way that they create regions that do not coincide with the settlement areas of minorities. And that's something that now um, Edina Sertic and I have recently looked in, in a paper that cam came out in West European politics and what we tried, and this was actually harder than we anticipated when we started this, um, we tried to figure out um, whether the um, an, a sub-state national group um, is actually a minority in a region and whether a majority of that group actually also live coherently in that region. And the main takeaway from this long table is that uh, the majority of groups in Eastern Europe that are territorially based and that do have parties that do make claims to self-government and autonomy, they actually live in non-coinciding regions. So they, they, where there is decentralization going on, it was to access um, EU funding, um, but it has deliberately often carved up these groups um, based on, of course, um, the trauma of um, the, the fall apart of these multinational states. Whereas you can see, oh, sorry, you can see that in, in Western Europe, we have several groups that actually have um, a coinciding region, 
and um, we had some missing data issues for the Basque Country and, and Corsica, but it looks like that they would also fit um, the pattern. We just couldn't find um, data on the number of Corsicans and Basques living outside the Basque Country and Corsica, so that we couldn't tell whether they fulfill our second condition. They definitely fulfill the first condition. So it's a really different logic of granting autonomy. There is um, autonomy being granted, but it's definitely avoiding unless for the post-conflict cases, is it's definitely avoiding um, giving autonomy deliberately to a settlement area of a certain group that defines itself as a, as a national minority. Second point that, um, so these forbidden fruits that the states deliberately avoided these solutions. Um, and now we don't really, what we couldn't really figure out in this article, because we only have two time points is whether which direction the causality runs. But we definitely see a correlation between these models of carving up minority regions um, and giving more limited autonomy and more limited demands. So you can, from all the parties that we cover in the EPEC expert survey on ethnonationalism and party competition, which we um, have done twice already, it's already been kindly mentioned by some of you before, um, um, what we can see um, here is that from all the parties, um, ethno-national minority parties we include in Western and Eastern Europe, there's actually now um, a majority being um, taking secessionist positions in 2017. So this proves also the radicalization point that I think Anvin was making based on the Frater data set. And, um, and we definitely also see this between our two time points that there is a radicalization of demands in Western Europe, whereas in Eastern Europe, we see that the, there's a very, very small share of secessionist minded parties um, that our experts deem um, as secessionist. And, and most of these are located in Bosnia, which is one of the more problematic cases that actually does have a strong territorial self-government arrangement in particular for the Serbs um, in the Republika Srpska. Um, and this comes despite the fact that some many times people tend to make the assumption that Eastern Europe is particularly problematic in this regard because all the minorities have kin states. That is true. Like you can see here that the majority of our um, parties appeal to groups that do have a kin state um, much more than in Western Europe. Um, however, this um, kin state interference takes place most of the time um, in, in a way that does not appear to radicalize the demands of the minority nationalist parties. So we do see um, like very limited solutions um, and also quite temperate um, minority parties making more moderate demands. Um, I should say that we do not in this article look into an alternative route to accommodating minorities that I think is quite relevant in the region, um, which is cultural autonomy solutions solutions that directly give like policy competencies on to the group without basing this linking this in any way to a territory. Um, so this is actually quite frequent and there's a long history of, of, of these kinds of solutions. Um, the last point that strings all this together, what does all this mean? Old challenges are new challenges. It means that what Brubaker said actually in 1996, a long time ago, is that the the question of nationalizing states, I think, is still topical if we even look at much more recent data that we still have states in Central and Eastern Europe that democratized later and that are still in the process of emphasizing their national identity and that they have looked, I think, quite closely at the experience of um, the fall apart of, um, of ethnic federations that had coinciding regions for minorities and that they continue to be quite sensitive and aware that um, territorial solutions can um, provide institutional resources for more radical demands and are still striving to keep um, their states intact. And I think some of the like recent like backsliding challenge that we have seen in, in, in the region, I mean, Matthias mentioned the challenge, challenger parties in the mainstream kind of on the, the majority nationalists. I think some of this is also, um, has, could also be interpreted as um, the fact that sovereign, sovereignty and 
claims about kind of um, building the nation also against the European Union, also against inter external interference, has um, can also be read um, still as as a even a return of um, this um, this paradigm of like nationalizing the state, and that means um, also trying to avoid um, any territorial challenges, and. Um, 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 yeah, from a historical perspective, um, this I think what we sometimes should do more uh, is um, try to think more of in what context we find our cases. So we tend to just throw things into our data sets and we are happy that finally we actually have quite good data sets on regionalist parties, on minority nationalist parties, majority nationalist or radical right parties now, the new challenges. Um, but we sometimes think that the synchronic comparison is the automatic solution to our research questions. But I think in many cases, diachronic comparisons might actually be much more appropriate because um, the nation states that we find today were substate nationalisms of yesterday. So um, if we look back in time, like I've recently studied um, Imperial Austria, and um, if you look back, of course, at the period before the World War I, then of course, um, the Czechs and the Slovaks, they were themselves minority nations within the multinational empire of Habsburg. So I think, I think um, realizing at which state of um, state formation and democratization and nation building a context is also helps to find good cases for comparison. And I, I do think that, um, yeah, this might sound now a little bit um, um, old fashioned, like this, like new challenges are the old challenges, but I do think that this is not like, this is still um, quite topical and that we only um, recently have the data to actually look at this comparatively for Eastern and Western Europe. And um, the yeah the ongoing process of ascertaining the majority nationalism, which is not yet banal, it has not yet become banal and everyday. It still has to be asserted because it's it's recent and it's fragile or precarious, as John Colony Connelly, uh, the great like historian of Central Eastern Europe, has called it, is is still something we should look into. And also, we should be aware that the fact that minority parties looking temperate has to be read against the background that the secessions have already happened. So the most radical cases um, uh, or the most cases with most um, like vibrant nationalism, they uh, already broke apart. Um, so the remaining cases are actually um, um, are actually the ones that are um, that are um, more um, more moderate. So yeah, um, I, I think my, my time is up. I want to throw out one last thing um, because I mentioned Ukraine in the beginning and I talked about nationalizing states and I, I do think it would be strange to talk about autonomies and minorities and minority parties without um, just mentioning um, at least um, this um, current case. And um, I just want to throw this up. I, um, and maybe someone wants to jump in for the discussion um, where you can actually see something unexpected, I think, from a kin state perspective that usually assumes that the minorities will then sort of turn to their kin state. But we can definitely see is quite the opposite, that there is a consolidation of the Ukrainian nation um, since, um, uh, since 2014. Our two time points also reflect this, like the parties move much more consistently to the Ukrainian um, side of the spectrum, the uh, Russo field parties that were much more, much stronger and had much more consistently um, pro Russian positions in 2011 have actually either disappeared um, or have um, moderated um, their position, I'm sorry, have, um, have actually become less pronounced. Um, and um, this is the same if we look at, at the identities. And I think, yeah, again, just throwing this case in because I think. We sometimes tend to focus on what is currently a minority region and what is currently a nation, but this process kind of shows us that it's all in flux. And um, yeah, so thank you and sorry for going a bit over time, but I felt it was important to um, also um, bring in this since we are talking about current challenges um, to our topics. Okay, thank you very much, Christina. I think there's a lot of food for thought and to make the best 
out of the remaining time that we have, I would immediately open the Q&A session. As always, please type your question into the Q&A um, part and I will read it out or the panelists can also see it. Until we get the first question from the, um, the attendees, I, I might open the question uh, or the session for questions among the panelists. So I'm not sure whether there is a question that one of you has to one of the others, or whether you would like to comment on some of the others' presentations or points. If so, just speak out. I would actually have a question to Matthias because you mentioned these like multiple challenges and the yeah the radical right um, the challenger parties um, and I kind of tend to think that and from a broader much more abstract comparative perspective as I said kind of also in my presentation this is not such an unrelated phenomenon so this is like it's always about nationalism um, and it's just whether sort of your you're having the state already or whether you're claiming to have a state from the bottom and we tend to think that I think in the we tend to really keep them apart in the party politics literature is, is very different so it's, we find very different people working on the radical right than you find working on minority nationalists also because minority nationalists can, have, can be very leftist of course we I'm aware of that but I would like to hear your take so what, what's the question? Uh, the question is to what extent um, it might make sense to take a more comparative perspective and study majority nationalists, aka also radical right parties, together with minority nationalists or aka sub-state nationalist parties. Okay. Uh, so study them together. Like uh, trying to figure out whether they have, um, what are the similarities or differences going on, like these two types of challenger challenger parties that are essentially both concerned with the nation in different ways, of course, but yeah. Mm. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, it depends, of course, if uh, I would say basically majority nationalism, I mean, uh, it depends from which perspective do you see it, because I mean, uh, also leftist nationalism is kind of nationalism. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you said, the um, the majority nation already has it has their state and and, and so on um but usually yeah the the, the um, like the, the populist radical right combination with uh, nationalism is uh, on, on the right so uh, i would say uh yeah i mean that's that's of course a point to to compare them and uh and to, uh, to look at them. I mean, I have uh, looked in, in the last uh, years a little bit on how um, majority nationalist parties actually uh, speak about territorial issues. And uh, I have looked especially at the AFD, for example, and I've seen that uh, that they, they have a really diversified agenda. So they, they are in, in some regions, even uh, like uh, in the east, but also in Bavaria, they they, they are like minority nationalists somehow. Mm. Um, for example, in Bavaria, they 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 were speaking much more about uh, territorial issues than than the CSU, for example. So they were challenging the, the CSU on territorial issues in, in the end. So I think it it makes, of course, a lot of sense to compare them. And uh, uh, on the other hand, yeah, um, is it a, a left right question? So I don't know, but I, I think, of course, that the question makes sense and, and we should compare them in, in the end. So I'm definitely with, with you in, in, in this sense, yeah. Have I answered a little bit the question? Yeah, about... yeah, totally. And the AFD is actually super interesting in that regard also. Um, I mean, when you said um, it's not clear in the German case, the center periphery cleavage, I think it's uh, there's actually very good data now on identity that actually shows that we do have a center periphery cleavage between mm. the West and the East. So Eastern, Eastern Germans are, are actually quite likely to think of themselves primarily as Eastern Germans, like typical minorities, whereas West Germans just think of themselves as Germans because yeah. kind of they're the dominant group. And Yeah, what I've seen, for example, in, in Eastern Germany, that their, their primary identification is not with, with Eastern Germany, but it's more with their, with their own land. 
So we have seen in, in the last, since, since reunification, we have seen a, a strong, uh, I mean, a strong rise of regional identity in regions which even weren't regions or like uh, weren't regions uh, back at, uh, in the 90s or they, they have just created and they have developed some kind of regional identity. And the AFT, as I have seen in, in their manifestos, uh, they are exploiting these uh, sentiments and these, these issues uh, quite strongly. Of course, um, in, in Germany, we don't have a strong regionalist party which questions Germany in the end. So maybe uh, maybe uh, the radical right, for example, in Spain, the, uh, the, the new party Vox in, in some regions is much more centralist than, for example, like, for example, the Basque country in Catalonia, it, it has a really centralist again agenda. And in other regions like uh, the, the Valencian community, they, they are speaking uh, a lot about, uh, yeah, regional issues and, and regional mm -hmm. languages and so on. Okay, in the meantime, we have a question uh, from, the, um, uh, from, the, from the plenary, um, and it's a question directed to Anben. I don't know, Anben, whether you have seen it, or shall I, I otherwise I read it out loudly? So it's the, the participation of Wales as an independent nation in events such as the World Cup, and what does that mean for independence claims? That's such an um, excellent question. Um, so I think the World Cup has done a lot for Wales in different ways. Uh, a lot has been made, um, for example, of the visibility it's given Wales uh, as a nation. I think it's the smallest nation in the World Cup. But the political projects around that are also interesting. And they there are two which I think are important. One is that there has been a very deliberate project of nation building by the Football Association of Wales to construct Wales as um, uh, a nation uh, which has a very clear sense of identity, which is bilingual, it's Welsh and English, but it's also inclusive in other ways to do with gender and equality uh, uh, and race uh, and so on. So, so there's that nation building project. And I think that intersects in quite interesting ways with the movement for independence, um, because what uh, Yes Cymru in particular has done, uh, so Yes Cymru was this, is this movement which was, was um, formed in 2014, um, it has pushed for independence in a way which has almost kind of coincided very nicely with some of these nation building um, uh, ideas coming from the Football Association, Wales as bilingual, Wales as inclusive. Um, and Welsh, uh, yes, Cymru has been very effective at organising um, amongst grassroots um, organisations, and there is a very strong, for example, um, um, grouping within Yes Cymru, which is um, football fans for independence. Um, and so those kinds of projects have come together in a really interesting way, which actually results uh, in a situation where now, as a result of both football and Yes Cymru, you have this new wave of interest in independence in Wales, not necessarily confirmed support for independence, but indie curiosity is what it's called. Um, and a lot of that interest in independence comes around both of these different projects, which have understood in a way which Clyde Cymru, the Nationalist Party, hasn't understood or hasn't been able to achieve this interest in independence, um, which I think is really, which is really interesting. If there are no more questions, I have a, a question again for Matthias. Go so ahead. I found, uh, I found these other questions from, from the audience. So no, there are no other, other questions. And um, thank you very much, uh, Anvin, for your answer. I think that was a very uh, nice answer to the question. Um, so Emanuela, you're the last one for the last question to Matthias, um, because it seems that really attendees are leaving us. Um, we have 11 left only. Um, which is not even one third from the initial ones, but last question. Okay, now a very simple question because it seemed to me that Matthias addressed the, the theme of uh, regionalist parties uh, in power, especially uh, regionalist parties that have been in power for a long time, basically at, at regional mm -hmm. level, being potentially or actually challenged by, by new parties in, in 
in the times that we are living characterizes by many overlapping crises. Uh, so um, my question is uh, whether by analyzing <clears throat> Bavaria and, and South Tyrol, you are to some extent exaggerating the extent of these challenges and diminishing the, the resilience of regionalist parties in power at regional level, in the sense that uh, uh, a regionalist parties, by definition, are potentially challengers themselves, because they can always be rather confrontational with the state, mm -hmm. if they want, also with the European Union, with other regions. So in a sense, they are always in a position to, to, to fend off the, the, the challenge of, of new challenger parties because they, not, they can occupy the challenging position even from being uh, at the government at the regional level. And uh, it seemed to me that you have analyzed parties that are in government for a very long time and also not challenging the state to the point that other parties have been doing. So if you look at the SMP, it's been in office since 2007, and there's no sign of electoral uh, decline. Uh, uh, other parties in Catalonia, in spite of all the trouble, the institutional crisis, they are winning election after election. Uh, in the Basque country, there was a term, if I'm not mistaken, in which the PNV lost the, the government, but then it regained it soon after. So I, I'm asking a sort of reassessment of the, of the overall picture in, from a comparative perspective. No, you're, you're of course right. So, but, but that, that goes a little bit in the, in the direction uh, where, where I was at, at the end. So at the end, I, I mean, the, the, the case of Bavaria and South Tyrol was just to exemplify the changes. So the changes within the party system. So uh, I was just uh, trying to say if these regions, which have been extremely stable over 70 years, so nothing has changed or almost nothing has changed during 70 years, and then suddenly they are... Uh, I mean, there, there are uh, new parties for, uh, at the state level, we, uh, I mean, uh, statewide parties, uh, um, regional branches of statewide parties, new ones, then there are new uh, challenger parties, which are like new politics parties, there are uh, populist parties from the radical right, so it was like some two paradigmatic cases. Uh, to see the changes in itself that, that uh, at the regional level, so there have been changes unfolding uh, really quickly in a really uh, kind of short of time. The point was at the end, I was asking, uh, have these uh, regionalist parties, which are in the end establishment regionalist parties, uh, are they performing better than than uh, than other parties? And and my question was in that direction at the end. So. Uh, I, I believe uh, the, the, the examples you mentioned are, are, are clear. So, so the, the SMP, I know uh, uh, one of your articles, they have themselves like uh, try, uh, try to, to challenge the state through anti-establishment, anti-austerity rhetoric. So the question was, uh, have they, they, uh, are they more able to, to use this multi-level governance uh, like uh, structure to uh, do blame shifting or, or whatever. So, and my impression is, of course, yes, that, that, that they are they are more able to 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 act strategically. Although the comparative politics literature at the beginning said that these are niche parties and so on. So, of course, uh, my, my my final question during the presentation went in, in this direction, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, that uh, with the, the cases of Bavaria and South Tyrol, I mean, these are clearly paradigmatic cases, and uh, the I mean, the, the establishment parties are not challenging the state in the end, but uh, we don't know what, what what would happen. So, um, I don't know if I have answered, but your your concerns, of course, are 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 there. I, I mean. Yeah, definitely. And maybe now that the national governments are not in line with the, the dominant yeah. parties at no, the but regional the level, also in the Basque country, you play. mentioned Basque country, the, 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 the Bildu coalition, uh, they also, they when Podemos came up, so they, they used, they tried to, to, to use their, their same strategies like this anti-establishment, 
then uh, like some kind of populist strategies also like uh, with social social movements and so on so also in galicia so the 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 bloque nacionalista gallego uh, also there and and they have managed to to succeed in the end so they they have they, they they were losing a lot of votes when these new parties emerged, but now they they have used that the these own um rhetoric strategies and and let's say also somehow populist strategies of these new parties, and they have managed to to, to come back and to 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 gain new voters in, in this uh, in these political spaces, I would say. So that that was the question. Are they more able to 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 act strategically in that sense i really don't like to do it but i have to say that i get signs that we have to finish who's <laughs> stopping us zoom <laughs> no zoom is not stopping us but theresia is stopping us my kids are screaming outside their room because my partner has covid and this and oh. unable to do anything so a few external interferences are stopping us <laughs> um but um uh, thank you all for coming um and especially thanks to all the attendees that have been joining and that have been um listening to this very interesting discussion that we could um i think or that we would uh, the best would be to continue it over a glass of wine now um unfortunately that is not possible as we all know and we discussed previously um however thank you very much we hope to make that discussion um become real again sooner or later um and yeah i don't know whether you would like to say a final word from your side to the panelists um there is no interaction from the panelists that i could see so no questions or something else if not yes thanks um the, the, the four of us uh, nuria said that um, i should say that she oh, yes. <laughs> unfortunately to leave at six uh, for another um event that she had to, to participate in um yeah can we can we stay on two minutes just panelists sure 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 yeah Let's just say goodbye sure so bye bye to all the audience, bye -bye, audience. thank you very much for listening to us <laughs>